Welcome to one of the most densely populated places on Earth. When Britain took Hong Kong in 1842, it was just a cluster of fishing villages. In a few decades, they had made it one of the busiest, richest trading posts in the world. The British Empire wasn't just about conquest and government and chaps in shorts telling foreigners what to do. It was also about money and profit. It began with a few unscrupulous adventurers and it grew into a vast network that spanned the globe from Britain to Australia, from Calcutta to Jamaica, from Australia to Hong Kong. Off the coast of China, British traders made fortunes from ships freighted with addictive drugs. And they helped themselves to the riches of ancient India. Money flowed to Britain from piracy in the Caribbean and from estates worked by slaves taken from Africa. Empire trade and empire theft helped make Britain a world capital of money it still is today. Hot afternoon in September 1668, a fleet of nine ships sailed home to harbor in the Caribbean. There was wild celebrating on board, for these brethren of the coast, as they called themselves, were returning from a smash and grab raid on the Spanish town of Portobello in Central America. They had stolen a staggering 25,000 pieces of eight. That's the Spanish dollar minted in pure silver. It was worth about 10 million pounds at today's prices. Leading the so-called brethren was Henry Morgan, a ferocious, hard-drinking Welshman from Monmouthshire who made his living by theft and violence. Men like Morgan were the founding fathers of the British Empire. For it began not in trying to rule other countries, but in robbing them. But this was piracy with a twist. It even had a different, more respectable name, privateering. It worked like this. The government licensed merchant ships to attack and rob the country's enemies, and in exchange, the government got a share of the stolen goods. This was empire building on the cheap. The freelancers took the risk, the government took the money. The pirates' victims were Spanish ships. These were laden with gold from their colonies in the Americas. Morgan's base was a place that had recently been seized from the Spanish. The island of Jamaica. The British set up a new capital here, 
Port Royal in the south of the island. With its vast number of taverns, brothels and rowdiness, it quickly earned the name the Sodom of the New World. Then all that came to a sudden end. Peace was declared between Britain and Spain. But Jamaica stayed in British hands. Henry Morgan saw the way things were going and decided to diversify. He hung up his cutlass and bought 4,000 acres of land on which he built a second fortune. The empire had been conceived in robbery, but it grew fat on the cultivation of sugar. Theft was the past, trade was the future. The British at home had developed a lust for sugar to sweeten the novelties arriving from the tropics. Coffee, chocolate, and tea. The British were already becoming a nation of sugar addicts. Sugar from Jamaican plantations could satisfy their sweet tooth. But the island's population was tiny and the plantations needed vast amounts of labor. The answer to the problem lay in the traffic of human beings from Africa, the slave trade. The British didn't introduce slavery to the Caribbean, but they took to it with enthusiasm. Traders bought slaves in Africa and then shipped them thousands of miles across the world. Many died in the packed, filthy, airless cargo decks. Sugar was a back-breaking crop to harvest. The cane had to be cut down and then stripped of its foliage and then transported to the mill, often in intense, blazing heat. The plantations devoured slaves. Within three years of their arriving here, a third of them would be dead. By 1775, a million and a half men, women and children had been forcibly transported from Africa to the British West Indies. Their descendants now people these islands. Treating human beings as beasts of burden made the owners of sugar plantations rich. This is the planter's house on the Good Hope estate, built in 1755. Its owner was 23 when he bought it. He became the wealthiest man in Jamaica, owning over 10,000 acres of land and 3,000 slaves. The sugar planters, known as the plantocracy, enjoyed enormous power. Each estate was its own little tyranny. And since slaves enjoyed no rights, the planters were free to behave as dictators. One was Thomas Thistlewood. He'd been a farm worker in England, 
Slavery turned him into a man of means. He fancied himself a man of letters too, and kept a diary. Even though we all think we're familiar with the routine horrors of the slave trade, when you read what some of these slave owners did, it really does make your stomach heave. Here are three accounts of punishments meted out by Thistlewood in three months in 1756. Darby catched eating canes, had him well flogged and pickled, then made Hector shit in his mouth. Rubbed Hazard with molasses and exposed him naked to the flies all day and to the mosquitoes all night. Flogged Punch well and then washed and rubbed in salt pickle, lime juice and bird pepper. Made Negro Joe piss in his eyes and mouth. Thistlewood kept a tally of what was known as nutmegging, the rape of female slaves, something he did by his own reckoning on 3,852 occasions. He would allow his guests to do the same. When these slave owners went to church on a Sunday, they doubtless did so believing they were good Christian folk. They behaved as they did because they didn't regard their slaves as fellow human beings, but as their property to do with as they pleased. More than two centuries later, the memory of slavery hasn't faded. How long ago did your family originally come to this country? Uh in 1760, mm -hmm. um, according to my grandmother. And how did they come here? The first one in that line that they remembered in 1760 when he when came over was that actually he was taken from the Gold Coast in Africa. As a slave? As a slave, yes. And, um, and he ended up in Jamaica, I think, on a good old plantation. And um, a lot of times when my grandmother talked, she would actually cry. Um, because um, even like we were standing here in a mill like this, they would put the cane in one hand mm -hmm. and um, a horse would be... Um, a horse? Yes, would, would, would be turning it, like treading the mill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and when they turn it now, the, 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 this part would take in the, the, the cane and squeeze it, squeeze the juice out. Oh, and it. the juice comes out and, of the and funnel the juice there. now would come yeah. out from uh, at the front of it here. Uh, and, and so when, when they were working a slave and they would work him for 12 hours and he would fall asleep, he would have to have an axe here, that, that if his hand, if, if he fall asleep and, 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 and he made a mistake, and his hand go in here, he would have to chop it off. Yeah. You know, when someone in my extended family probably yeah. was involved in bringing your ancestors over here as slaves. And yeah. Um, it doesn't make you feel furious. No, I think, um, I think for now we have passed that in this generation. But let's be realistic, you were, as slaves, being used as beasts of burden, essentially. Yes, yes. It's hard to understand why some people would, would want to do that to other people, or, or want to say, um, you should work for me for all of your time, for generations, and I'm never going to pay you. I hope that in Britain one day will look at us even in Jamaica and say, um, Jamaica made us rich. Jamaica was the, key, the, the sugar capital of the world. Eventually, the people in Britain became so outraged by what was happening in the Caribbean that the slave trade was abolished in 1807. But the wealth of the fledgling empire didn't come from slavery alone. There were riches of a different kind to be found on the other side of the world. 